what another video on this topic about this game yeah uh, there's a lot to cover here and it's an interesting game and it's not just about the game there will be some pretty interesting techniques and besides I told you I was gonna promote this heavily this board is really easy and super easy and cheap to make and as far as its playability it's okay but it's probably the easiest way that you're going to get a high-end board. So take a close look at this. So there's a lot more than I can fit into the main videos about this game. So in this video, I'll discuss a little bit about how this is constructed, and I'm going to prototype a lid, which I'm not sure as of yet whether or not it's going to be in my final good board. We'll see. But I'll discuss a little bit about the finish that I use to make this board, and I'll also go over how you can make these pieces, which are super cool looking. Let's start. By looking at the tiles though, these are really inexpensive. This kit is about six, seven bucks. Why? Because it's ceramic. The benefit of ceramic is that it's cheap, it's widely available, and what else? They're perfect. They're flawless. Uh, they're probably the most size consistent tiles that I've seen or used ever. So I can recommend it for that reason alone. What else makes ceramic great? Well, first of all, this. It's that easy to peel it off of the mesh. Now because this is kind of rough, you'll have to address this part. I used some one millimeter craft foam. It kind of looks like suede, but it's not. I just sprayed it with spray adhesive and then stuck it on. Now you can easily find craft foam like this that already has adhesive on it, but it's just as easy to make your own, and that way you'll have a lot more color options. This was really easy. Sometimes when you butt two tiles together, there'll be a microscopic gap in between them. If that bothers you, if you're seeking perfection, you can do this. Now when you look at the board up close, you can't even tell that there's a tiny little taper on, on all the pieces of foam, but it just ensures that they fit together nicely. So what are the benefits of using foam on the bottom of your tiles? They create a lot of friction between the top surface. And it's soft, and it's very inexpensive and super easy to find. So do I recommend it for ceramic tiles? Absolutely. I will discuss the glass stones a little bit later. For now, I'm going back to my main project, which is this lid thing. And I'm really hoping that it works. It's kind of a cool idea for a storage solution. Now look how perfectly the ceramic Okay, I've started with these trapezoid shaped blocks. They're going to get cut down later. And a piece of plywood that matches the base. And I also have another piece of plywood that will go on top. What is he talking about? You'll see in a little bit. If you've been following along and you've watched some of the other construction videos, then you remember with a wooden board like this, I used a piece of cotton string all the way around the perimeter to ensure that there's a little bit of flexibility here. Keep that in mind. I don't want to confuse you as I go forward, but that is, you need to understand that for the placement of the bases and especially as we go forward here. What I'm doing is finding this imaginary center point right here. 
Now, if I stretch my imagination a little bit, I can see the hexagons as a set of circles that all touch each other on the sides. The circles don't really tessellate, but if you close pack them, you know, like this, then they make the same sort of hexagonal arrangement. I'm telling you something that you already know, but that circle that fits inside of the hexagon will have the same width as one of these tiles. So I'm going to start by finding the center point and then I'm going to draw a bunch of circles all the way around that just touch each other. And you'll see where I'm going with this in a bit. Disclaimer, before I go on, you have to cut me a break about the metric system. It gets really tedious. I can't keep responding to it. I'm going to remove any metric related comments. So just bear with me here for a minute. Now there is some spherical aberration, but this is very, very close to an inch and three quarters. What I do in my head to cut a number like this in half is half of one is half and half of three quarters is three eighths. So I just mentally add one half plus three eighths, which is seven eighths. I know that's complicated. That might not do you any good. Um, you might argue that the metric system is way easier. Whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm just telling you what I do. And of course, you're free to find an improved system for yourself. So here's a piece of acrylic glass with some sandpaper on it. And this is how I keep my compass nice and sharp. I've been using the same piece of sandpaper for probably eight years. And again, our magic number was seven eighths because that's our radius and our diameter is one and three quarters. A Steel rule works great for this because it has a little indentation that keeps your trammel point from moving. And I can just barely see my circle on all sides. And that's good because I want my circle to be, if anything, slightly bigger because I want it to be forgiving as it space, uh, spaces out since the overall thing is larger because of the cotton string expansion space. I hope you understood what I'm talking about. At this point, it's just a matter of placing the compass cent center point on these lines that extend to the ape apexes, apexes, apices, I don't know. That There are six apexes on the hexagon, the six points and the lines that go to them define where the center points of all of these circles will be. So now I just have to take the next 10 minutes probably and draw circles. Okay, I figured it out, but it kicked my tail. As tight tolerance geometry usually does, let me explain, and I brought this out to remind you that, well, to, to nail this level of perfection, you can't just rush into it and make a bunch of circles that radiate out from the center. You actually do have to come up with a plan. I'll show you what I did. So if we press the tiles together, first of all, I'm reminding you that there's a little bit of play all the way around. So let's press this line together nice and tight and then they measure something like 12 and an eighth, a little bit heavy. Now, what we need to do in order to get one circle centered in this place, see this slot? I want to find that position, the center of that. So, we'll push all these out to the two ends so that they're locked in there and there. And now measure the distance from out to out, which is something like 12 and 5 sixteenths. That's the number for the final circle. So, if I were to 
draw a circle that starts at the very center, I want to find this position right here and draw that circle on my grid over there. You'll see in a minute. I keep saying that, but you will. So because of compound error, as we start in the middle and work out, error accumulates and it just gets work, worse. So what we want to do instead is we want to define our parameters on the outside and then work backwards. And then error is able to be easily, more easily divided in between. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I've decided to go with a 6 and an 8th inch radius. There's the mark, and you can see how far I was off. This circle will represent my outermost boundary. So at this point, you should consider everything that I have here incorrect, except for that, and the center circle. So now I can put a circle here, just touching the outside of the circle I just drew, and then if I center these two in between that, in between the center circle and this, then they should be spaced correctly. Ha! Lucky for me, there are two sides and you won't see the back side anyway. So here's the correct way to do it. Perimeter, perimeter, uh, perimeter circle first, then the center circle, and then a circle that's tangent to the perimeter circle, and then these two just get spaced in between. You really have to take this seriously. You can't underestimate how precise this has to be. Um, okay, so now I can do this on every single one of these radii, and I'll see you when I'm done. Oh, this is another important thing that I shouldn't leave out. I'm also going to transfer all of these center points here around by doing this. Well, I'm almost done. It's amazing as I sit here and do a geometric construction, it's, I, I'm reminded of just how much I've come to rely on technology. And sometimes doing it, it, it's much easier to print out a template or something, but it's nice to get back to basics. There's something therapeutic about it and it's an important skill to maintain. Okay, so what I ended up doing was drawing a straight line here and then the space that's left in between here I'm using this you won't be able to make it out but they're actually um, hexagonal axes on this thing so I just fit that in between here I'll give you a shot you should be able to make the faint lines out on there now it might look off just because of parallax or the goofy camera view, but you get the idea. The one line will go between these two circles and one will go between these and then I just mark the center point. I can't do it with you in the way, but you know what I'm talking about. Now I'm in business. After going through all that work, really all I needed were the center points so that I could drill these out. This step is optional but it's probably a good idea just to limit my likelihood of making a mistake. The, that circle is the same size as this drill bit and it'll just help me line it up. It caught me right there. I can't get the last one on the drill press simply because the drill press is in the way. But I have a trick.
Remind me someday to show you how to make one of these. It's a great tool. I don't want to just sand the pencil lines off because, well, the laminate is so thin. I still had to do a little bit of sanding, but it's not that bad. Sanding sucks, but one thing that I can tell you to help it, clamp your work down because it makes it more efficient. You want to transfer what energy you're using into the board. Don't let it go to waste. That was great. I love sanding. No, I don't, actually. Okay, so next is the top. This will be the inside, and this will be the actual top. So this is the part that has to be pretty. And this I will slide along until I get rid of most of those knots and imperfections. Something like that. Okay, so here's how it works. This part will be attached to these blocks, and this part will be attached to that part, which in turn is attached to the block, so all of this will lift off and, as one piece. All the holes allow the stones to remain in the center of a tile for a storage solution. This will kind of like snap down in and hopefully self-center the stones and they should stay in place. This is a prototype, but wish me luck. So it's very important that none of them stick up above. I was pretty careful when I made this hexagon to keep it flush with the dimensions of the original board. So, what I can do is glue this to this piece, and then when I'm all done, I'll be able to sand this and those blocks at the same time to make all three of those components flush. If there is a secret to success with glue-ups, it is preparation. I have everything that I think I should need ready. It's up on a 2x4 block so that I can quickly get my clamps underneath, and I've made a sandwich out of two pieces of tempered glass to squish these two pieces together. Yeah, 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 you can never get enough clamps, I know. Every single glue-up has kind of an improvised feel. They're always just a little bit different. So you have to kind of do this dance, and they don't really tell you this in glue-up school, but it's not like you just do it and then leave it. You kind of have to rig it together and then move around as it... to the, And you have to move to the place where it needs attention, if that makes any sense. So I left the glass on, the top layer of glass, for maybe two, three minutes, just enough to tack it up. And then I took the glass off and started doing this, moving around, moving the clamps around where it needed pressure and cleaning the squeeze out with a toothpick where I could. It turned out nice, but I don't have a cameraman, so I wasn't able to, you know, capture it all. Doing this little silly dance is kind of hard to explain and you just kind of have to do it yourself and let experience guide you. But as it squishes down, you can kind of, it will stay there and then you can move to a different spot and you keep moving your attention around until it's done. And you have about, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes before you have to just leave it alone. Hope some of that makes sense. And here it is in its final form. Like I said, they all have an improvisational feel to them. We'll pick this up tomorrow.